thanks for being here. Um, how many of you are have a leadership role or, or serve in a code of conduct committee in, in a project? All right, fantastic. Uh, how many of you have to deal with uh, projects within communities uh, from time to time? Okay, great. Um, well, uh, just a, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Joanna Lee. I'm an attorney and a mediator, uh, and one of the many things I do to support uh, open source foundations and projects and communities is I help them uh, with code of conduct uh, incident response and sometimes help resolve uh, interpersonal and community conflicts. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, applications uh, to use mediation and conflict resolution tools in open source communities. We'll talk about um, traditional approaches, uh, traditional and newer approaches to conflict resolution. Um, and the potential benefits. Um, we're going to focus particularly on transformative mediation, which is uh, a, a newer form of conflict resolution that I think has a great benefit and potential uh, for application in open source communities. Um, we'll, uh, we'll share some knowledge and tools that you can start applying today, um, and uh, I'll direct you uh, to some resources if you're interested in learning more. Um, so my own personal journey uh, and uh, relationship to conflict started with um, being an incredibly conflict-averse person. Uh, most of my life, I have, when there's conflict, I run and I duck in the corner. <laughs> um, I, I am an attorney, um, but I very consciously chose to be a transactional lawyer, um, which means I'm negotiating agreements between parties who want to work together and not, uh, not litigating disputes. Um, but in the course of my work, um, increasingly I found um, negotiating um, led into uh, developing skills as a mediator. Um, and I started doing a code of conduct work for foundations and communities, and that put me right in the center and heart of conflict. Um, and along the way, I've been adding tools to my toolkit. Um, including studying nonviolent communication, um, different theories and forms of conflict resolution, uh, authentic relating and uh, radical honesty approach to conflict resolution, um, and reading all sorts of books on negotiating and uh, conflict. And so I've gone from being a very conflict averse person to being conflict embracing. And what I mean by that, this is, this is Joanna's own personal view uh, and theory of conflict, um, but I see, I used to see conflict as this terrible, uncomfortable, scary thing that was to be avoided at all costs. I mean, to the point that I would just, you know, say yes to avoid having, a dis having to engage in a discussion about something that I disagreed with someone on. Um, and now I see conflict and disagreement as such a, uh, a natural, even healthy, valuable, and necessary part of human interaction and just being a whole authentic person, um, especially in relation to others in community. Conflict presents an opportunity. Um, on the other side of conflict, if people are able to move through it and resolve it uh, successfully, you know, and we can define success in a, a number of ways, um, there are often great rewards on the other side. You can think back to a time when you've uh, maybe had a conflict with a, a friend or a spouse um, or a family member, and you actually work through it. So think about the, the understanding, the, the intimacy, the connection, um, the going from, oh, they're the threat, they're the problem, the enemy, to, oh, they're a human being uh, who also has needs and desires and goals and fears just like me, right? Um, there, you probably learned something along the way. Um, there was probably an understanding and shared reality bridge. Um, so, uh, and the conflict, really, uh, really juicy conflicts have this tendency to expose what's invisible. Um, underlying motivations, underlying fears, underlying resentments that have been in the background from, for, for some time. When we engage in conflict, that's an opportunity for all that to come to the surface and an opportunity for it to be, uh, for it to be resolved in a, in a way that's very meaningful. Uh, that doesn't mean conflict is always productive. Um, whether it's productive or destructive really depends on how people show up in that conflict, how they engage with each other. Uh, and so when we talk about mediation and conflict resolution, I'll be talking about the conditions and the tools that help create the conditions for people to show up as their best selves. Uh, so what is mediation? Um, there are a broad range of definitions of mediation depending on who's writing the definition. And a lot of them have um, 
been written in the context of uh, mediation for settlement of legal disputes. Um, the one that I particularly like, because it's simple and to the point, um, is at the top here. Mediation is a process in which an impartial third party facilitates communication and a negotiation and promotes a voluntary decision making by the parties to the dispute. So if there are a, a few key words here. It's a neutral third party intermediary um, and uh, there is a facilitation of communication um, and the decision making by the parties involved is voluntary. So that mediator isn't imposing a decision upon them, um, isn't telling them what they're supposed to do, uh, isn't taking sides, isn't, isn't taking a, a necessarily a position in the conflict, but helping them communicate. And there are mediators who have a more directive approach where they are offering opinions on, you know, I think you're right on this point and, you know, you have a weak case with regard to these issues. Um, and those are, those are also forms of mediation, but, but that's not the type of mediation we're going to focus on today. Um, so some of the benefits uh, in general of successful conflict resolution. Um, you know, one is uh, if people are engaged in a conflict and they resolve it, they might come to an agreement on how they're going to move forward. Um, and that's great. Even if there's not an agreement and there is really just an agreement to continue disagreeing, um, there still can be other benefits of that, the dialogue uh, of engaging uh, in discussion around the issues of conflict. Uh, one is sometimes having that discussion helps either or both parties really get, cl get clarity. Get clarity about the nature of the conflict itself. Um, I'm sure you've all had the experience of, you know, you're having uh, an argument with somebody and what you're arguing about isn't really what you care about, right? You know, it might be about, uh, hey, you know, you, you left the dishes in the sink again, right? It could be a household chore. It could, and, and often underlying it, there's, there's something else. There's something there's about, there's a, there's a deeper human emotional component to that. Maybe it's feeling underappreciated. Maybe it's um, feeling taken advantage, advantage of. Maybe it's, you know, you want more attention or you want more appreciation from your partner or your friend or your family member. Um, it's often not usually just about the dishes, right? Um, so engaging in, in, in healthy dialogue around conflict can help, gain, uh, help people gain clarity and understanding about what's important to them and what's important to the other person. Um, it can result in a more peaceful and harmonious relationship, uh, learning and growth for either of both people, uh, greater un of understanding of self and other, um, greater empathy, uh, the ability to restore that uh, seeing the other person as a fellow human being rather than a problem or a threat, um, and a greater sense of personal empowerment and, and, and agency. And sometimes there's a sense of closure that comes with, a, with a, having a conversation, uh, whether or not uh, it results in uh, agreement, uh, full agreement on how to move forward. Uh oh, my clicker. Okay, there we go. Uh, so how can we apply this in open source communities? Uh, well, one is when interpersonal conflicts arise uh, in a community, it could be about, you know, uh, you know, how, why, did, why didn't you merge my uh, pull request? Um, or, uh, you know, why wasn't I chosen for this program committee? Um, uh, et cetera. Or it could be, you know, it could be rudeness that's happening in a community space. Um, and uh, both people feeling, you know, like they're very justified in their positions. Um, it could be a disagreement over the technical direction of a project. Uh, another potential application is in code of conduct incident response. Uh, so there is an increasing, um, Increasing movement um, and desire uh, in many open source communities to apply a restorative justice framework to code of conduct incident resolution. And I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that in a moment. Um, I do want to note that mediation, uh, where two people are, are, are talking with each other with the, uh, the conversation facilitated by a third party, uh, you know, they can't be forced on anybody. Um, if that decision, if that conversation is going to happen, it has to be completely voluntary um, on everyone's part. Um, so, uh, increasingly, uh, open source communities are, are trying to find ways to um, apply restorative justice, um, especially in uh, communities that are very social justice uh, minded and oriented. Uh, and restorative justice is a framework uh, and theory of justice that was developed in the 1970s as an alternative to retributive justice, which is a punishment based uh, theory of justice. Um, uh, and it focuses on healing and restoration of harm. Um, particularly with respect to the person who is the uh, so-called wrongdoer and the person who is the victim. 
You know, and in many conflicts, it's not going to be clear who is the wrongdoer and who is a victim. Sometimes they'll both point the finger at each other and say, well, they're the wrongdoer, I'm the victim. Um, that, that does happen, and that's also a situation in which uh, facilitated conversation um, uh, can sometimes uh, help with resolution. Um, for in a, in a, uh, in a pure re restorative justice framework, though, um, that conversation typically isn't ha doesn't happen unless in advance um, the person who's the so-called wrongdoer has taken full responsibility for their actions and, and the impact. Um, and the idea be behind that conversation is that there's healing and um, restoration of the interpersonal relationship through both uh, the, the wrongdoer uh, giving an, a sincere apology and also hearing and empathizing with the impact on the victim and then the victim also you know, receiving that apology and, and witnessing the, uh, the, uh, the remorse is, is somehow restorative and healing to them. Um, uh, so if there is going to be a restorative uh, justice conversation, having really good mediation tools um, that that third party facilitator can bring to help create a safer space um, and help the parties um, uh, achieve that outcome um, is, is very helpful. Um, transformative justice is another theory of justice that is, uh, is having an impact in code of conduct work. Um, and that is a theory and framework of justice that was developed in the 1990s that focuses um, on broader, more systemic issues that may have contributed to uh, or encouraged the, uh, the problematic or wrongful behavior. Um, mediated conversations can help illuminate and uh, create awareness of these systemic issues. And there are forms of mediation that are very social justice oriented. We will talk about uh, one of them later. Um, uh, and those help deconstruct and shift narratives and stories um, that, are, that perpetuate uh, inequities and power imbalances. Um, so potential benefits um, of uh, conflict resolution uh, tools specifically as applied to open source communities is that um, it can contribute to more harmonious uh, relationships. Uh, it can help parties gain clarity about what's really important to them and, and uh, understand each other. Um, and creating opportunities for learning about how one's actions are perceived by and impact others. Um, you know, it's one thing when, uh, you know, if somebody who violated a code of conduct receives an email um, after the investigation is completed and says, you know, hey, you did this thing, it violated the code of conduct, and, you know, shame on you, right? Uh, please don't do it again. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's, it creates a whole other dynamic when they actually talk to somebody who is emotionally impacted um, by their action, and they're looking, you know, face to face with that person and recognizing, wow, um, my action actually had an emotional impact on this person. Um, it, it helps the internal, internalization and learning um, about one's own behavior uh, in, in, in a much more meaningful way than just getting an email that it describes what, what you did that you really shouldn't have done. Um, also, uh, if there is a conversation and people voluntarily come to an agreement on how they're going to move forward, whether it's how they're going to behave and treat each other going forward, or you know, how the project's going to you know, resolve this disagreement over the technical direction. Um, those agreements and commitments tend to be so much more durable. People are so much more behind them when they've, had, uh, they've participated in that decision making um, versus a, a having an outcome just imposed upon them by um, whether it's a project leader or a code of conduct committee. Um, oh, and also, feel free to feel free to, uh, inter to interrupt with questions at at any point. Um, so there are there may be uh, a narrow set of situations in open source communities where you know a formal mediation session where you've got uh, people engaged in conflict and uh, a, a neutral facilitator um, uh, facilitating that. Um, but there are still so many benefits of learning conflict resolution skills. Um, if you are in a management position, if you're in a project leadership position, if you're part of a code of conduct committee, uh, really, if, I think all human beings <laughs> um, should probably have some conflict resolution training because it makes us better people. Uh, it helps increase our ability to, to learn, understand things from another person's perspective, um, maybe uh, redirect when, uh, when a conflict is starting to spiral out of control. Um, so it can, uh, the, the skills that you learn when you uh, study conflict resolution can be applied to helping you have difficult conversations more effectively, um, supporting contributors uh, in, in their disagreements uh, uh, being expressed more respectfully, uh, diffusing conflict when it arises. Uh, so even outside of a formal mediation session, there are so many benefits to, to uh, understanding a little bit of theory and uh, a practice in conflict resolution. 
Uh, so here are five uh, very common approaches to mediation. There are, there are many more. This, is, this list is not, even ex not exhaustive. And the, the first three are sometimes referred to as the big three in that these are the most commonly uh, used approaches of, uh, to mediation uh, used today. Um, so, uh, and you know, which one is best? Well, it may depend on the situation. Uh, some mediators really are very strongly attached to one particular approach uh, for all types of, con of uh, conflicts. You know, I personally tend to use the facilitative, uh, well, we'll talk about what those are, but I, 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 t I tend to uh, use uh, some approaches in some situations and then the transformative approach in, uh, in others. Um, but for, for purposes of today's discussion, I, I really want to evangelize transformative mediation for a couple of reasons. Um, one is it's human-centric. Um, some of the other approaches to mediation are great for commercial and business and legal disputes. But when we're talking about messy human beings just trying to work together, um, a human-centric approach um, tends to be more, more effective. Um, it also doesn't require legal knowledge or training. Um, you can study and become a, a transformative mediator without, without having a legal background. Um, also, I think it, uh, it's very consistent with a lot of the values of open source. Um, it's all about honoring parties, self-determination, and empowerment and agency. It's also so much simpler to learn and apply than any of the other, uh, other approaches that we'll, we'll talk about today. So a brief overview. Um, so evaluative mediation is typically only used in, uh, in legal disputes. And this is where uh, somebody who's uh, sort of in a quasi-judge role, but is a neutral mediator, goes to each party, usually talks to them separately. They're usually in separate rooms. And you know, they go to party A and say, hey, these are all the weaknesses in your case you really need to settle. And then they go to party B and say, hey, you, know, you don't have a case. You're not going to win. You're going to spend so much money in lawyer's fees. You really ought to settle. And then they, they go back and forth. <laughs> and they try and pressure the parties to come to an agreement by really um, uh, capitalizing on their fears of loss. Um, not a great approach, I think, in open source communities. Um, facilitative mediation is really about problem solving. It's about, it's about uh, have any of you read the book or are familiar with the book Getting to Yes? Okay, great. Um, well, so for those of you who haven't, um, so this is very much an interest-based versus position-based um, uh, mediation approach. So you're, you're helping parties find common interests and common ground and focusing them on that. It's very future oriented, not about whose fault is it in the past, uh, you know, how do we assign blame, but how do we move forward productively. Um, there's often brainstorming about solutions um, and uh, the getting to yes uh, parable that's, that's so often cited is uh, two people are, you know, are fighting over an orange and uh, they both have the position the orange should be mine. Well, so that's their position. Um, and those are mutually inconsistent positions. They can't both have the orange. There's only one orange. But then if you ask them, well, why do you want to use the orange? Um, and one of them says, well, I want the, um, I want the peel um, you know, to, to make something out of. And the other says, well, I, I, I want to make juice out of, the, uh, out of the flesh of the orange. Well, if you look at their actual interests, the, the why they want the orange, um, there's actually a way to get to yes. You know, one of them gets the peel and the other one gets the, um, the flesh of the orange. Um, so that thinking is, uh, is the thinking that drives facilitative uh, mediation. Uh, understanding, uh, I'm going to address transformative uh, approach last because we're going to do the deepest dive into that. Uh, Understanding-based mediation is also, um, it's a type of human-centered approach to mediation and, and the theory underlying this is that um, the key to solve, resolving conflict is creating understanding. That's understanding of yourself, understanding of the other and their perspective, and then also understanding of practical realities. You know, for example, you know, maybe, maybe we would all uh, love the project to, uh, I don't know, uh, host uh, the next conference in, um, you know, in Hawaii and uh, pay for, uh, you know, all of us to have a week vacation there in the, you know, <laughs> tail end of conference. But, uh, you know, there, there are vegetarian constraints. So, um, so it's, you know, it's not just understanding perspectives, it's understanding constraints, uh, resources, and practical realities. Uh, narrative mediation is a very, very interesting approach to mediation. Um, and I think this is going to be very uh, appealing to many uh, social, social justice-minded folks. Um, the theory underlying this approach to mediation is that the stories that we tell others and ourselves and the stories that we buy into collectively as a community, um, as a society, um, help shape uh, not only the way we identify ourselves and how we see others, but also how we relate to others and how we see conflict. 
So for example, you know, I could tell a story of, um, yeah, you know, that, that, that person over there is just, you know, a total jerk. Um, they're arrogant. Uh, they're dismissive. dismissive. Um, you know, they, they hate me because I'm a woman. Okay, that's a story I could tell. You know, whether it's true or not, I mean, you know, who knows? That's, that's subjective. You know, I could also tell the story of, you know, I, I, that, that person could be having a bad day. Um, they could be dismissive because they're in a rush and they're really stressed. Um, I could, you know, I could, I could tell other stories about that. Um, so a narrative-based uh, mediator is, uh, helps the parties uh, understand what their stories are, deconstructs, it, uh, de deconstructs those stories, and um, questions the underlying assumptions uh, of those stories, and then helps the, st the, the parties come to a new, uh, new narrative that is more a, a, peace, uh, a peaceful narrative rather than a conflict-ridden narrative. Um, and uh, this is a very involved approach to mediation. Um, it's very interesting, but it's very involved. It requires a lot of training. It's very time consuming. Um, and the risk there is you know, the mediator is also imposing, the goal is to impose their own narrative on the parties, uh, which there are times that that may be useful, but there are times when, um, you know, maybe that's not the best way to honor people's self-determination. So the transformative approach to mediation um, uh, is uh, it's based on a, a very uh, well-developed um, theory of conflict uh, that has been based on many different areas of uh, psychology and social science research. Um, and uh, the basic theory is this. So conflict can be constructive or destructive. Um, people tend to experience conflict from a place of weakness um, and self-absorption. And weakness being being confused, not quite knowing what to do, feeling powerless, feeling, feeling frustrated. Um, and self-absorbed meaning uh, unable to get out of your own frame of thinking, unable to see uh, the other person's point of view, uh, unable to even see the other person as a person. They're a threat. They're a problem. Um, they're not a human being, right? Um, and uh, but it's also possible to engage in conflict from a place of strength and uh, responsiveness. Strength meaning uh, having clarity, um, feeling empowered, um, not feeling the need to be defensive and protect yourself, but instead feeling in a place of, in a place of uh, empowerment and, and being able to make choices, understanding that you do have choices, um, which allows you to be more responsive to the other party. So when you don't, you don't feel like you need to defend yourself when you're in a place of strength, that, that gives you the ability to see and hear the other person's perspective without feeling threatened by it, even if you don't agree with them, but at least, at least see and hear them. Um, so uh, furthermore, the theory goes that if when people are engaging in conflict from that place of strength and responsiveness, they are so much uh, more likely to make better decisions for themselves, and they're so much more likely to be able to collaborate effectively with the other person on finding uh, a path forward um, that is, uh, that is uh, acceptable uh, to all. Uh, and, oh, okay, here we go. Um, so these are, these are cycles of conflict. So here we have, um, this is the destructive uh, cycle of uh, conflict. Um, so when somebody's feeling weak, you know, unsettled, confused, fearful, disorganized, defensive, et cetera, you know, th then that feeds into their self-absorption. Um, and the more self-absorbed they are, they are the, the more they tend to invalidate the other person's viewpoint. Um, and then the other person now, now feels weak and attacked and the need to defend themselves. And, and, and both people tend to dig their heels in and, and you get caught in this vicious cycle. Um, however, there's also a constructive um, conflict cycle. So when both people are calm, decisive, in a place of clarity, um, they're able to be open, attentive uh, to the other person, able to see the other person's perspective, willing to see the other person's perspective. Um, you know, and if either party moves to this, it has a tendency, not always, but it creates an opening for the other person to also move to the constructive side. Because when the other person acknowledges you, sees you, you get, oh, they're, they're hearing me. Maybe they don't agree with me, but, but they're acknowledging that I'm human. 
that creates a sense of, of, of empowerment, of strength, of validation that allows you to also say, okay, well, you know, yeah, thanks for, thanks for recognizing, you know, my, how I feel about this. You know, I can also, I can also recognize that you may have some valid concerns as well, right? Um, and if parties, the more they can move here, it, it, it does create this, this very, it can create this very positive cycle. Um, and I think we've all, you know, we've all been in these situations where, you know, it'll spiral. It'll spiral downwards if we're in a, in a destructive uh, cycle, and, and it, can, it can result in great closure and resolution if we're in a, uh, in a positive, uh, constructive cycle. Um, and so the th uh, theory also goes, how do we move from weak to strong, self-absorbed to responsive? Um, and it's through empowerment and recognition shifts. And so... Um, by empowerment and recognition, you know, empowerment means, um, you know, people feeling like they have choices, uh, people being given choices, um, people being acknowledged, um, and, and recognition is about uh, seeing and being seen. You know, when, when you feel seen, you are more likely to, you're, you're going to be more, more open and willing to see someone else. So, um, so what a uh, transformative mediator is doing is, so again, there's empowerment shifts and recognition shifts, and, the, and these all feed into each other, is um, we're, pr we're using practices and tools that help the parties, uh, create opportunities for the parties to, uh, to move from destructive to constructive uh, conflict cycles. Uh, and so uh, let's talk a little bit about what those tools are. Um, there are um, uh, well, a few more words on the theory. So uh, the theory also goes that people are capable from moving from a constructive to from a destructive to constructive uh, cycle of conflict, um, and they n want to do so. I mean, if you can think of a time when you were really frustrated or upset uh, about something, it's not fun being there. It's really not fun being in a place of weakness and self-absorption. Um, it's not fun being feeling weak, and the self-absorption also causes an isolation. Uh, you know, we're social. We are social animals. We are wired to have uh, for connection with other human beings. And when we're in a place of self-absorption, we feel like we are cut off and isolated from everybody else. Um, the theory also goes that people can make these shifts, or are more likely to make these shifts when they're supported in doing so. And so that is a transformative mediator's role helping uh, provide people with support so that they can make these empowerment shifts and recognition shifts and move to a more constructive place. Um, so a transformative mediator really, really does honor self-determination. They're not nudging, they're not pushing, they're not saying, hey, there's a solution over here. I, you know, I know how to divide the orange. They're, they're going to facilitate a conversation because they want the parties to come to that conclusion on their own. The thinking again that when, when parties, um, when people come to a decision on their own, it's so much more meaningful, it's powerful, it's empowering to them, rather than somebody in, you know, saying, okay, well, I know what's going on here. I really, you, know, you need to divide this orange up and this is how you do it. Um, I'm not saying, you know, there, there are definitely situations in which that is, you know, warranted, helpful, et cetera, but that's not a transformative approach. That would be more of a facilitative approach to mediation. Um, uh, so there are, there are some other practices, but these are the three basic practices that a transformative mediator uses. And they're extremely simple, but uh, I can tell you it's, uh, it took me a four-day class and plenty of practice to really, to, and I still feel like I'm improving in all of these areas. But one of the tools is reflection. Reflecting back what each party said, using their own words and emotional energy and tone, um, Oh, okay. So you you know you you, you know you, you think Josh is a total asshole? I, okay, um, you, you were really just trying to do your best, right? Um, reflecting that back um, for a few reasons. One is it helps. Remember, it, when the parties are in destructive conflict, they can't hear and see each other. So they're not going to provide that seeing and validation for the other. So part of the mediator's role is to see and provide that acknowledgement and recognition to each party. So it gives them a sense of empowerment so they can, they can start making those subtle uh, shifts in, in the right direction. Also, when people are engaged in destructive uh, conflict, 
they really truly don't, like they physically almost don't hear each other. It's like they're tuning out the sound of the other person's voice. It's like the other person's voice is so annoying that whatever they say, it just, it just goes right past you. You just, you just disregard it as not even being valid. And when you hear the mediator say it again in the mediator's voice, like it allows, it allows the other person to actually hear it from a neutral party. And they're like, so they're hearing it a second time, but in a different voice. Um, additionally, sometimes people will say things they don't really mean, you know. Um, they'll say things extreme like, oh, you know, that they, they never, ever, ever do the dishes. They, they never say anything nice to me, right? And, you know, when the mediator repeats that, that gives a person to hear back what they said reflected, and then they can think, oh, is that really what I meant? Or, you know, and sometimes they'll correct. Sometimes they'll say, okay, well, I, okay, I didn't mean always. I meant most of the time. Um, and so um, th that's, that's a purpose of reflection. There's also summarizing. So at, uh, at key points in the conversation, summarizing, hey, you know, this is, this is the nature of the conflict. These are the points uh, that you agree on. These are the points you disagree on. Um, and the, the purpose of this is uh, it, it helps the parties get really crystal clear because when people are engaged in destructive conflict cycles, um, they can be very confused, they can ramble, they can even lose sight sometimes of what they're, they're, they're arguing about or, or, or trying to resolve. Um, and, and hearing it summarized in a way that's very pointed can help them organize their thoughts. Um, and then there's checking in, so asking questions um, at, uh, at potential decision-making points to remind uh, the parties that, that they have choices. You know, again, this is, an, this is an act of empowerment. Uh, so these techniques are, are very, very simple, but again, to learn them, uh, and welcome, um, to learn them, uh, training and practice is, is really strongly recommended. Um, and if you, if you want to learn the transformative approach, um, I'd recommend uh, taking a transformative mediation course with Dan Simon. Um, he's one of the thought leaders and major contributors um, to the field of transfer, transformative conflict resolution. Uh, Dan is who uh, I did my training with, and, and he's just really, really excellent. Um, um, but uh, if you don't want to do you know, the, the formal training, um, you know, hopefully the, what you've learned today and then the discussion is going to follow now you know, can still help uh, you with both a, a way of looking at conflict and, uh, and some practical tools that you can start applying right away. You know, so, so when you're engaged in conflict or you see somebody else engaged in conflict, um, you know, s start thinking about it as, you know, is this, a, is this, you know, is this person feeling, you know, weak and disempowered? You know, how can, how can I support them um, in feeling more empowered? How can I remind them they have choices? Um, some of this is, uh, you know, just, just listening, just listening to somebody, uh, you know, and not, uh, uh, you know, with or without giving advice, but usually without giving it, just listening, um, showing empathy, um, seeing a person, acknowledging them, um, that can create an empowerment shift, just that simple act. Um, if you feel comfortable, you can reflect back, uh, you know, what, what you understand their experience was, you know, either in their words or your own words. Um, also conversing in ways that emphasize that a person has choices. So using open-ended uh, questions um, to, to uh, remind people that they're, they're in a position of choice and, and empowerment. You know, even beginning a meeting with saying, you know, what, what would you like to talk about? You know, would, uh, uh, or, you know, asking somebody, do you still want to keep talking about this? Do you want to take a break? You know, that's the type of check-in that a transformative mediator would use throughout a conversation. Um, Um, and uh, I, I, I love to uh, harvest the, the wisdom of a group um, uh, when uh, talking about these types of, uh, the, these types of issues. Um, so uh, you know, I'd, I'd invite you all to just think about, um, think about a conflict in your life you know, that is now you know, more or less resolved. Um, what helped you get from what helped you get through that conflict to the other side where, where you felt, you know, clear and uh, a sense of uh, being in choice and you knew what decisions to make? You know, whether the conflict got, you know, resolved in this so-called amicable way or not. Is anyone willing to share? Yes. Well, first of all, I wanted to say this was excellent. You did an excellent job. And Thanks. I won't be quite so personal, but I will... Um, I, I will tell a very specific dispute that would, there, there was a dispute that had been going on for years, two years, and, uh, and it was a, a 
about contracts and things that people needed to do. And each management chain was hearing from their own people that, oh, you know, the other guys were turkeys. Mm -hmm. And when it, we finally got both of the senior managers in the room, the problem was all about revenue recognition. It was that this company could not agree that they hadn't performed because they'd recognized the revenue. Mm -hmm. and, and that, without that fact, uh. for two years, they mm -hmm. have been fighting with each other. So uh. I think that your process of getting the underlying, you know, getting having a common understanding of the actual underlying facts mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is, is very important. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. So I'm going to repeat that for people online and people who may not have heard on the other side of the room. There was a two-year dispute between two companies. It went on for two years, and it got resolved when the managers got in a room together and talked. And they found out that it was a, it was a, a way in which revenue was being recognized. You know, and this was, this was, I mean, it was a legal commercial dispute, but it was also a very human dispute in that employees were angry. They were like, oh, they're an asshole, they're an asshole, right? Um, and it, it, it got the underlying uh, cause got unearthed as soon as the managers got in a room and talked to each other. I mean, you know, imagine what would have happened if they, they didn't wait two years to talk to each other, right? <laughs> um, so h having information and sometimes just having a conversation. What else? What else has helped, uh, has helped you um, move through conflict? Uh, you, and then you. Mm -hmm. um, on a simply, like, time-based thing, when actually talking to people live, having everyone step back and accept that they're humans and maybe they need food, water, and sleep has helped a lot. All right. So asking that question before you start any difficult conversations and making sure everyone is ah. set mm -hmm. has made all the conversations I've had go easy. Great. Thank you. I'm going to repeat that again for the people online. Um, so it's before having a, a conversation about the nature of conflict, you know, really, really checking in, making sure people's needs are met. Saying, you know, does anybody need a break? Do you need water? Please take care of yourselves. Uh, please get enough sleep. You know, get food if you need. Oh, are we... One minute. Okay. Yes. So I heard, I, I heard two things there. Thank you. Uh, the importance of listening. You know, both if you're the party in conflict or you're, you're assisting somebody in conflict. Just listening. That, that, that is so helpful. And then reminding yourself, hey, this person that's disagreeing with me might actually have my best interest at heart. They might actually be trying to support me. You know, how, how, however, uh, you know, whether or not their methods are effective or not, they may actually be trying to help and, and seeing and acknowledging that. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. On fire just because the people could not talk to each other, they look each other in the face, but it was all in text chat with no human context whatsoever, mm -hmm. no ability to read somebody's face, and mm -hmm. all of the human expressions are so important in the situation of conflict. So, a basic rule that works always. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, face-to-face -face interaction instead of just trying to resolve in chat. And uh, I mean, we're out of time, but we'll we'll take one more comment. Yes. I, I just wanted to kind of. Uh, sorry, we're out of time. So we probably we'll probably just take longer to uh, address. But I wanted, to, echoing that, I think so many of the conflicts that we come across in this space are, uh, by definition, they're in a chat or they're they're in a comments uh, section or they're in a comment thread on GitHub. A lot of the conflicts that I've had to work through, there's not really an opportunity to bring people face to face and yeah. that can have that challenge of the not being able to meet face to face, but mm -hmm. also it becomes performative. It's very difficult to get people to climb down from their position when they're actually yeah. not trying to resolve the conflict themselves. They're trying to perform for the other people that they think are watching them in the comments and, mm -hmm. and I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah. Um, do, do we have to be uh, out of the room right now? Okay, okay.
thank you. Appreciate the flexibility. So the question was, you know, sometimes there aren't really good opportunities to bring people face to face because the conflict's happening in chat. And then there's another. Uh, I heard there's another issue happening where there's a there's a performance aspect, right? People are feel like. Um, uh, you know, they feel like uh, they have to perform for for other people in the community. Uh, you know, they they can't they can't back down because they don't want to show weakness or they don't want to show that they're you know they're not um, they're not being loyal to their friends who are part of the conflict, right? So all all these factors, you know, one is if you um, having uh, trying to resolve it in the public chat can be very challenging and sometimes can actually uh, spiral in the wrong direction. It can actually help uh, escalate things. So you know, to the extent you can, you know, reaching out whether it's by video chat or you know instant message and having a, a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation with each person who's involved in the conflict separately, you know, before you even attempt to bring them together, um, is is sometimes uh, helpful and necessary. You know, and sometimes you can't get them. You know, sometimes right in the heat of the moment. They're, they're not open to, uh, they're not really open to correction or self-reflection. So you just even ask me, hey, can, can we just take a cool off period? Can we just, can we just like take the night off, talk about this again tomorrow? Can, can we just pause? Because sometimes even just uh, asking people to pause um, for an hour a day, that in itself, sometimes they come back and they're a little bit more rational and then you can have the conversation with them about, hey, you know, that, that, that didn't land, what, what your comments in the chat didn't land well for, for a number of people. Yeah. All right, well, we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. Um, <laughs> and I, I'll be around in the hallway, so happy to chat one-on-one -on -one with uh, any of you who have questions. Yeah, thank you.